The Wobegon had just reverted to real space when 114D's audio sensors registered unusual sounds from aft. An activation click, a prolonged hiss of energy, a dopplering slash, a stuttering exhalation of breath. The sounds were followed by a sudden outpouring of heat from the corridor that accessed the cargo bays and what might have been interpreted as a gust of wind. Only by adjusting the input rate of its photoreceptors was the droid able to identify the blur that raced into the cabin space as a male moon, dressed in a hooded robe, trousers, and soft boots that reached his shins. Makap? Pepe, Wandao, and Zuto turned in unison as the Mune came to a momentum-defying stop a few meters from where the four of them were seated. Clenched in his right hand was a crimson-bladed energy device the droid's databank recognized as a lightsaber, a weapon used almost exclusively by members of the Jedi Order. And yet the recognition prompted a moment of bewilderment. The Jedi were known to be guardians of peace and enforcers of justice. But the Mune's comportment, the set of his long limbs, the feral working of his jutting jaw, the yellow blaze in his eyes, suggested anything but peace. As for justice, 114D couldn't retrieve a single instance of the four crew members having performed an offense that warranted capital punishment. The humming lightsaber dangling from his left hand, the Mune remained silent, letting his posture speak for his nefarious intent. In turn, the crew members, realizing that they were being wrongly accused, clamored to their feet, reaching at the same time for the weapons strapped to their hips and thighs. That the Mune permitted them to do so furnished 114D with yet another mystery, at least until it realized that the Mune was merely courting combat. The droid wondered what Captain La could possibly have said or done to arouse so much wrath in the Mune. It replayed the memory of her priming the blaster. Had she decided that the problems the Mune presented for the Wobegon could best be solved by killing him, only to have misjudged him entirely? Regardless, it was apparent that the Mune believed the entire ship complicit in Captain La's actions and had decided to take it upon himself to mete out retribution of the cruelest sort. 114D assumed that this would include him and instantly initiated a series of redundant routines that would back up and store data in order to provide a record of what was about to occur. The face-off tableau in the cabin space had endured for only a moment when Wendao, who had served as a bodyguard for a celebrated hut, leapt into action, drawing and firing his blaster even as he raced for cover behind one of the bulkheads. A split second behind, Markop raised his weapon and fired a continuous hail of blaster bolts at the moon. In the same instant, Zuto and Pepe, crouched low to the deck, sprang forward in an attempt to outflank their opponent and place him at the center of a deadly crossfire. From the passageway that led to the cockpit came the rapid footfalls of the pilot, Blear, and the ship's Dresselian navigator, Simasali. 114D knew that they had been monitoring cam feeds of the cargo bay and thought it likely that they had witnessed whatever sentence the Mune had levied on Captain La. The Mune's reaction to the barrage of bolts that converged on him required almost more processing power than the droid had at its disposal. By employing a combination of body movements, lightsaber and naked right hand, the agile sentient evaded, deflected or returned every shot that targeted him. Slowly surrendering energy, the bolts caromed from the deck and bulkheads, touching off alarms, prompting a switch to emergency illumination and unleashing cascades of fire-suppressant foam from the ceiling aerosols. No sooner had the Balasar and the Decelian entered the cabin space than hatches sealed the corridors, preventing any escape from the melee. Only 114D's ability to calculate trajectories and react instantaneously to danger kept it from being on the receiving end of any of the numerous ricochets. Spying Blear and Simasali, the Mune hurled the lightsaber in a spinning arc that took off the Balasar's antenna palps and scalp and most of the wrinkled Vesalian's left shoulder, misting the already agitated air with teal-colored blood. As alarms continued to wail and foam continued to gush, Blear folded and fell face first to the slickened deck, while Simasali, screeching in pain, collapsed to one side, reaching futilely for his severed arm with the other. The lightsaber had scarcely left the Mune's grip when Wandao flew from cover to bring the attack to the Mune, triggering his blaster as ceaselessly as Markop was still doing. This time, though, 
the mule merely stretched out his right hand and absorbed the bolts. Traveling up the length of his arm and across his narrow chest, the energy seemed to fountain from the hand awaiting the return of the spinning weapon as a tangle of blue electricity that hissed from his tapered fingers, catching Wandao full on and lifting him to the ceiling of the hold before dropping him to the puddled deck in a heap, as if his bones had turned to dust. In strobing red light, Markop's eyes tracked the rise and fall of his broken comrade. His blaster depleted, the Zebrak drew a vibroblade from a belt sheath and launched himself at the Mune, his large right hand intent on fastening itself onto the Mune's spindly neck. The Mune caught the lightsaber, but instead of bringing it to bear against Markop, he danced and twirled out of reach of the vibroblade and commenced parrying the Zebrak's martial kicks and punches until a sidekick to the thorax drove Markop clear across the cabin and slamming into the bulkhead. 114D's audio pickups registered the snap of the Zebrak's spine and the bursting of pulmonary arteries. Now Zuto and Pepe dived at the Mune from both sides and actually managed to get a hold on him. But it was as if the Mune had turned to stone. The Kalish and the Quara attacked with teeth and claws, but to no perceptible effect. And when the Mune had had enough of it, he positioned the lightsaber directly in front of him and gyred in their grasp, taking off Pepe's tusked face and Zuto's blunt, whiskered snout. 114D's olfactory sensors detected an outpouring of pheromones that signaled the death of the Kadish. Zuto, on the other hand, though gurgling blood and moaning in pain, could perhaps be saved if treated in time. Straightening out of a wide-legged stance, the Mune deactivated the lightsaber and scanned the beings he had killed and those he had maimed with chilling exactitude. His yellow eyes fell on 114D, but only for an instant. Then he fixed the lightsaber to his belt and went quickly to his nearest victim, who happened to be Duzuto. Dropping to one knee alongside him, the Mune gazed intently at the Quora's twitching body, but precisely at what the droid couldn't surmise. Zuto's bulging marine eyes seemed to implore his assailant for help, but the Mune did nothing to stanch the flow of blood or offer palliative aid. He remained by the Quara's side for a few moments, then moved quickly to Markap, from whose crushed chest cavity blood bubbled with each shallow breath. Again, the Mune ran his eyes over his victim, from Markop's tattooed face to his large feet. Eyes closed, the Mune adopted a posture that suggested intense concentration or meditation, and Markop snapped back to panic-stricken consciousness. 114D tuned into the Zabrak's pulse and found it regular, but only for a moment. Then the rhythm of Markop's heartbeat grew ragged and breaths began to stutter from his lungs. Soon he was dead. The Mune appeared to be frustrated, and his disappointment increased on finding that Blear was deceased as well. He spent only moments appraising Simasali before going to Wandao, who was conscious, though obviously paralyzed from the waist down. You dishonor your heritage and your weapon, Jedi. Wendell managed to say. You could have used the Force to compel us to do as you wished. I've not only seen that, but experienced it. The Mune's face contorted in distaste. If you've so little will, he said in the tongue of Wendell's species, then you're of no use to me, Klatuinian, and ended Wendell's misery with a click of his thumb and middle finger.